This morning, I'm going to give you a word and minister something to you, and I think uh, I want to make an appeal, and then we're going to minister to a few of you because this is so, so on God's heart. We're going to do some reading uh, of the scriptures, and then I'm going to land on a very, very popular scripture. But uh, we're going to be studying the word them. If you're taking notes, and I anticipate all of you will be, I want you to write at the top of your notes, them. And I'm going to explain to you two dimensions of them. There is a them I want you to go after. Come on, look at somebody say, go after them. Come on, say, go after them. But then there is another them that you are to avoid becoming like. Now tell the, the person next to you, don't be like them. So there is a them you need to pursue and go after and create for and relate to and reach to. But there is also a them you need to not ever look like. Okay. So I want you to go to Mark, the second chapter, verse 13. If uh, my team is back there, put it up in the New Living Translation. I kind of fell in love with that this week. Dr. Hart Ramsey helped me to really like the New Living Translation. Kind of blessed me. So we're going to use that. The New Living Translation, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. All my iPhone users say, Hoo! <laughs> Praise God. We're yet praying for the, um, the others. <laughs> the etc. Amen. Pastor David, all right, God bless you. Mark 2, 13, then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. And as he walked along, he saw Levi. Levi is a biblical name for Matthew. Uh, and he was the son of Alphaeus sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, for, for perspective, a tax collector... Uh, in the New Testament was considered a member of the mafia. They were debt collectors, and a part of what they did was oppress the poor. Thank you so much. A part of what they did was put heavy burdens on the poor. It was akin to people coming to the door of the ghetto requiring and requesting the same amount of money as the rich. So to be a tax collector was to be a political monstrosity to a society. When you were a tax collector in the ghetto, you were seen as the oppressor. You were seen as the robber. You were seen as somebody worthy of death. Nobody liked the tax collectors. I think we're still struggling with tax collectors. Anybody ever buying tax time? Fam, listen, I used to, when I was broke, I would praise God for tax time. Now, I hate to see it coming. I'm like, good God from Zion. I be trying to claim everything. Cats, dogs, carpets. I'm like, how many cell phone minutes can I write off? Jesus Christ. But he went and walked past the tax collector's booth saying, follow me and be my disciple. Jesus looks at social grime and tells him, follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said this to him, so Levi or Matthew got up and followed him. Check this out, verse 15. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. That is very, very, very important to see. To his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. So not only did Jesus call Matthew, he called other people like Matthew. And then not only did he call other people like Matthew, he also called sinners of ill repute. Now look at what the New Living Translation says. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. So it did not mean that they were followers of Jesus just yet, but they were always around Jesus and what he was teaching and what he was doing. Look at verse 16. But when the teachers of religious law, that is literally the term Pharisee, write that down, Pharisee. If you've never done a scriptural study of the term Pharisee, it is important that you do so immediately. You need to immediately understand Pharisaic culture. And what you will find out is how similar many of you are to many of them. What you're going to also find out is you may have been raised up in ministry by one of them. And you're also going to realize how Pharisaic American Christianity can be. Mm -hmm. Now, the term Pharisee literally means separate or detached. It means separate or detached. And the, the career of the Pharisee was to interpret the law. You get that? 
Verse 16 says, but when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating. Now look at me. That means the Pharisees ain't never not looking. One thing Pharisees do by profession is look. They keep up-to-date information on everything. And it's interesting because if you don't agree with it, why are you studying it so bad? But they have all kinds of updates. They always, but well, sometimes I feel like somebody's watching me. When the teachers of religious law saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciple, look at what the Pharisees who were teachers and interpreters of the law of Moses said. Why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I have not come to call those that are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. iPhone users, thank you. If you got a Blackberry, just get out. I'll refund your whole registration. You don't even, it's just gone. If you got a, 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 a remember them chirps? If you got a pager, get out of America. You should not have a beeper. Matthew 9 and 9. Now, the reason I'm teaching this to you like this is so you can see it must have been an emphatic point of Jesus because it is in every synoptic gospel except John. This is one scenario that all of the, uh, the disciples observed and saw, which means it was important to him. In Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors, disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Same exact narrative in a whole nother book. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Luke 5. It's going to help you understand something in one minute. Luke 5, verse 27. Praise the Lord. iPhoneers, et cetera. Humble yourself. Luke 5, 27. Later as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi, that is Matthew, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me. Be my disciple. Jesus said to him, so Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And it's interesting that somebody who is social scum understood honor. I think it's so profound that somebody that had no religious upbringing, no church history, held a banquet in honor honor. I think that's so peculiar. Many of the Levi's, many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. They, they quantanea, they broke bread. So eating, going to dinner or breakfast in the Bible time was not just about a date. It was about an implicate, it was an implicatory statement about intention for relationship. If I invited you to my house to eat, it was not because I had nothing else to do. It was an implication of covenant, the word quantanea, it's fellowship, wanting to relate. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complain, now look at this word, bitterly, because you cannot be a Pharisee and not be bound by bitterness. When you are full of the law of Moses, you're going to grow bitter. That's why religion ages you. You ever see somebody bound with a spirit of religion be 20 and they look 70? 
I don't care if you're mad. You ever see somebody that grew up in church and that's all they know, Monday choir rehearsal, Tuesday Bible study, Wednesday YPWW, Thursday prayer and fasting, Friday, Friday prayer and fasting 2.0, Saturday early sunrise service, and then Sunday morning communion, and they end up getting bags as heavy as sand. But one of the things religion do is wear you out and take your zeal. They complain bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? Now, it's interesting to me that these are people who know the Bible and still see people as scum. I'm talking to you. I think it's very interesting that they know Hebrew, Greek, they understood the patterns and principles of the prophets and had the audacity to refer to anybody as scum. I think it's interesting to know. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. My real text and study is going to be Matthew 23, but I want to show you why this is very important. From the wedding at Cana to Jesus sitting at, at, at the table with the tax publicans and the sinners, did you realize that one of the accusations against Jesus was that he was a drunk? I know because you don't read your Bible. One of the things people accused Jesus of was being a drunkard. And they accused Jesus of being a drunkard because he hung with drunk people. And the people that got upset, they literally called him a friend of wine bibbers. And then when the Jesus wouldn't respond to that, they told him he was demonized. They said, you can't, I know you got a deliverance ministry because only because a devil is empowering it. They said, you cast out devils by the authority of devils. Now, how retarded is that? To, to think that a demon would empower somebody to cast out a demon. Jesus looked at them and said, if I cast out devils by a devil, then by whom do your children cast them out? He was able to justify the inconsistency in their theology by letting them know that it does not make sense. Here's another thing Jesus said to them. John came neither eating or drinking because John didn't fool with a lot of people and you didn't accuse him of having the, a devil. But yet the son of man comes and is sitting among them and you accuse him of being a wine bibber and a friend of sinners. Jesus not once in the New Testament, I have receipts, rebuke the sinner. I'm going to let that sit in because you're religious. I know you are. Not one time. Go ahead. Google it. Right now, Google it. Call Mother Smith. Call Mother Johnson. Call your local prayer strategist. Call all of them. Not one time. Here's why. The Bible said the word of God judges a sinner. Jesus never rebuked somebody that didn't have a premise for right rebuke. You know who Jesus always rebuked in the Bible? Them. He sat with them and rebuked them. Here's why this is important for you. If you are in business, if you are building a church, if you are building an organization, you are running a rat race by aiming it only at church people. I hope to God the internet never has a glitch because your future is gone. You have based your entire future on a church brand. And if you ain't realizing yet, church people are fickle. After they're done with you, they're going to find something new to be impressed with. If you ain't learned it, you'll learn it really quickly. It is a very consumer-based culture, and they are fan-oriented. Don't get it twisted. You will only be famous for a fleeting moment. After that, they'll find a new trend. There are folks selling deliverance, selling a, a prayer clause. And then they get swollen thinking that they're going to build a future off of the support of church people. And I love God's church. I lay my life down for God's church. But I believe that only a fraction of us should be concerned with changing the church. If you do your homework, God told 12 men to reform the church. 
but he told everybody else to change the world. And I'm concerned about the longevity of what you're doing because you're aiming all of your resources towards religious people and nobody's aiming at the bigger audience, which is the world. Grab somebody next to you and say, broaden your audience. Conference is going to get you so far. Seminar is going to get you so far. The church is such an oversaturated market. And I understand your fear because when you start doing stuff beyond the church, the church gets mad. <laughs> when, when the church looks at you and says, oh, oh, no! Ain't no preacher got no business in no movie. Come out from among them. Be ye separate and sit in your closet and fast. going to the White House, the White House, you tell me one scripture that justifies a separation of church and state. In the Bible, there was no such thing. The reason why we are in the hell that we are in is because y'all convinced preachers to come out of politics when politics was born from the prophets. We wouldn't have a, I'm sorry, we wouldn't have a circus show in America if we had the righteous on Capitol Hill. Here is the hypocrisy. My, I hope y'all praying because I'm out here now. I was trying not to do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to really do it. How are you mad that preachers want to run for government and y'all got to vote for bishops? I'm a little confused about the inconsistency of theology. You got to run a campaign for something that the Bible say is appointed by another man, but you mad at other preachers for wanting to be mayors and commissioners and governors? Get rid of the spirit of the parasite. I don't care who you are. You cannot have a political process and not have a spirit of corruption. them Jesus when he appeared in the Bible he appeared in the church and what happened a demon cried out do the research demon cried out in the synagogue and the Bible said and you know when it cried out when Jesus read Isaiah 61 the devil was, was silent until he said, and it's this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. Then a devil said, no! You know why? You will always know the spirit of the Pharisee because a Pharisee hates to see who Jesus wants to use. They, 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 the, one of the things Pharisees occupied themselves with was an infatuation with who Jesus chose. They could not fathom the fact that he would walk past the tax collector and say, yo, I see something in you, because they had been studying the law of Moses all the time and thought that they had command over who God should and should not use. And in case you have missed all 66 books of the Bible, every person that God ever chose was jacked up, including your nappy hair itself. Esther was jacked up. Moses had an anger problem. Noah liked a dark drink for a dark season. David had a little lust, praise God. And there is not one person that was used of God because they deserve to be. But when you study the law and you don't study the Christ, you become a Pharisee. It was not that the Pharisees did not believe the Bible. The point is they didn't know the point of the Bible. And Jesus told them, ye study the scriptures because you think in them you find eternal life. But the scriptures testify of me. If you know more of the Bible than you know the Jesus of the Bible, then your only option is to live and think and preach and breathe as a Pharisee. Quest, 
sinners didn't kill Jesus. At the end of his life, a sinner was still on the cross, dying like Jesus wanted and said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to humble myself. I ain't got nothing else to lose. In case you are the son of God, please don't forget me when you go into your kingdom. That was a sinner's response. The Pharisees were sniving and jeering because they were the ones that bribed Judas. Listen to me. Every Pharisee knows what it is to bribe people. The way we do it is not just pocketing money. We say, come over here and I'll make you the bishop of the galaxy. Come over here and you can be my youth pastor. It's a seductive spirit and it appeals to the ambition in men. You never build an organization by promising position. Don't you realize that position is temporary? The only people who crave position are those that don't know purpose. Purpose is more powerful than a position. And when I know my purpose, I don't care what position I'm serving in because the position is is not my purpose. I'm working in here. You don't build God's house on a cabinet. Now I realize why this seems so revolutionary and it seems so contradictory to what we all see. But this is the whole of our hate. There are more Pharisees in the world than there are real believers. After Jesus went to church, hey, Elder Joe, went to the church to cast out a devil. Then he went to a, 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 a wedding in Cana where his miracle was done. Then he's seen with prostitutes. Then he's seen with tax collectors. Then they call him a wine bibber. And all of these accusations came from them. They was mad by who Jesus chose to participate in. Visionaries, entrepreneurs, CEOs, God bless you. Let me give you a little wisdom. You're not going very far in whatever you're building if you think church people are going to finance it. <laughs> oh, you mad today? I don't care. It's painful. I don't care. Most church people want to be in full-time ministry. That's not doing well. I mean, I appreciate your tithe. But you're not going to build anything substantive off of the 10% of people who are okay with their debt. You need to have an eye for them. Oh, y'all not going Now, it's okay to give some resource to the church, but you can't let church people wear your intelligence out, burn out your creativity. Why? They are emotionally attached to everything you do. So if you build a product that offends them or come up with a program that excludes them, they're going to withdraw their money. But they don't have an emotional attachment to it. They just want answers to a problem. And all prosperity comes to those that get to the problem the fastest. Them. I think this is interesting, Pastor Melvin. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, teach us to pray. They wanted a pattern of Jesus' prayer life. I love this so much. Jesus said, okay. He says, don't be like them. Here is literally what it says. There are those that stand in public places and they think they shall be heard for their vain repetition. The next verse says, but be ye not therefore like unto them. For they think they will be heard for their much speaking. The Pharisees thought the more elaborate they were, the more impressive they were, the more eloquent they were, the more heard they were. Jesus showed a contrast. He said, don't pray like that. Now, does it mean that they weren't praying? No, they was praying. Jesus was just saying, those are the types of prayers that I don't hear. And then he says in the next verse, I could run here, but you, when you pray, I'm going to tell you your problem. You still have not resolved that you've got to be distinct. 
and you're not resolved that they can get away with what you can't get away with. There is still a line in the sand. You are never going to be received by religious people. I made the mistake of preaching on the grace of God to religious people and the backlash has not stopped. This whole nation is crying holy but they're not teaching grace and it is impossible to make a people holy when they don't know that they can actually be it. When you pray, go in your closet, close your door behind you, and then he said, when you fast, don't make a TV show about it. He said, when you fast, it's not for reality TV. He said, when you fast, I don't want you going around looking for the compliments because of your suffering. Shut up if you're going to fast. You're not fasting for applause. Nobody needs to be impressed by how much you go off in sacrifice with God. He said, but wash your face and put oil on your head. If you don't, you've already got your reward. In other words, Pharisees love to be seen. They all care about where they sit and who they know and who's their bro and who's their sis. They want fluidity and options because they, they have commitment issues. So they're not going to sign up for what they need because they don't want to lose the, secu the security of what's funding them. It's a Pharisee spirit and you can't be a powerful Pharisee. Show me one miracle done by a Pharisee in the Bible. It does not happen. So because the anointing is not on them, they've got to impress people with magic. Black church has been guilty of only putting emphasis on oratorical skill. We have been guilty of getting amens and preaching unto praise. But I still have not seen a stream that can preach unto power. There are many great preachers who wouldn't know what to do if a devil cried out. What they would do is find somebody who was not as known and say, hey, can you handle that? Or they would rush the demonized person out of the sanctuary and leave the demon in the man. All you would know is the men in black would come out and stop the devil from disrupting the service when what Jesus would have did is dealt with the devil so that these would believe. There is a remnant rising in this place that refuses to live like a Pharisee no matter what. I know exactly what's after me. And it ain't sinners. Pharisees. Pastor Pharisee. Evangelist Pharisee. Bishop Pharisee. Now, here's what Paul says about them. Paul said to Corinth, I know that there are so many among you who are in filth. I mean dirty, unclean, wickedness. But he told the church, this is how you interact with them. If not for God's grace, you would be them. Here's what confuses me. You take one stupid prophetic class. You go on one six and a half day fast until 5 p.m., which ain't really sacrifice because you was at work all day anyway and you're broke, so you can't afford food. So if you're only fasting because you ain't got no money, then it's not a real sacrifice. It's a diet is exactly what it is. You are halfway, you are one strong win out of the you you used to be. And all of a sudden, you forgot what you used to do to pay your bills. You forgot that you still don't know exactly who your baby daddy is. I know you're an evangelist now, but you was a thought then and I don't understand why you so hard on people as if you wasn't a hoe. I know you're not a hoe no more, but you can't ever forget what the power of God snatched you out of. It's what you came out of that you have authority over. And the reason they ain't got authority over it is because they still in it. Ah, but when you've been brought up, Come on, slap somebody, say, I'm one of them, I'm one of them. Look at somebody, say, I'm one of them. These are they that have had their robes washed 
It doesn't mean I started clean, but I sure enough got there. And because I'm clean, I'm not infected by the dirty. Look at somebody say, I'm one of them. I go to any of my son's churches, my daughter's churches, and everybody look clean. Everybody got on all right. Ain't no broken people around them. I'm going to rebuke the head. I'm going to tell them, why do you need the anointing if you don't want to be around bondage? The healed don't need a physician. I said the healed don't need a physician. I said the healed don't need a physician. You would be smart in your business plannings to make your target anybody in pain. Don't make products just for the church. Now, if you are the next Martin Luther, or if you are the next, you know, reformer, then yeah, let's change the church. But far more of us need to be creating solutions for our culture and for our society and let these religious people have at it. Go to Matthew 23. That escalated kind of quickly. Matthew 23. The Lord said to me, he gave me some instruction about the weapon of business. Listen to me. Business is a weapon. It is a weapon for you. For many of you, it's going to be a weapon through you. If you're not careful, a religious spirit will convince you to abandon the world that Jesus sent you to manage the church is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the saints and they that dwell therein for he had founded it upon the altar and established it upon the Bible study this thing is beyond you go to church for instruction your destiny is made manifest to the world. Stop becoming drained because of how they see you. So what they don't want you to sing? So what you don't get invited to the event? So what you don't get to hold your arm and grab your ear and carry their water and get the religious butler award in heaven? You need to realize that the anointing does not just work for church people. You can be just as anointed in the car lot just as anointed in city hall just as anointed in hollywood just as anointed in the marketplace just as anointed everywhere else any business built for the church is not going to be stable because they are emotional paul told y'all they were tossed to and fro that's exactly how your money's going to be you have no profitability if you build stuff just for the church. Build some stuff for them. But if you go to your block, you're going to find a hundred young people that don't have quality education. If you, if you go to the, the, the city around you, Inglewood in Chicago, you can find property for $1.99. Why are you infatuated with having to have a mic? Ministry is more than microphones. God is going to break uh, this Pharisee paradigm uh, that is not ministry unless people see it. Don't you realize that the demons in these cities know exactly who you are and when you show up to vote uh, or when you bring your business uh, that is just as much deliverance uh, as it is to grab a head and say come out. Think bigger. Matthew 23. I'm almost done. How many of you have ever grown up singing and learning the Beatitudes? I, I, I am a church boy, in case you can't tell. And uh, I had to study the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed is the meek, hallelujah, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I grew up learning that. I, one of the things that I praise God for is that I actually learned the word before I learned the world. Many of you are raising children that's in school learning the world before you put the word in them. And so their worldview is being shaped by little mini devils and agnostic educators because you want to dance with flags and don't want to complete degrees. You want to be the one who sings the song but don't want to get a certification. You want an ordination in here but not a license out there. The reason that's not trustworthy is because we have theatrics in here. It's easy to fool church people. How many of you have ever seen a courtesy fall? <laughs> there have been people I've been in the middle of prophesying to it before I could get the word out and they knew, oh, he's about to tell my stuff. Drop. That wasn't the glory. You just didn't want me to say no more. The Beatitudes was Jesus' message to the masses. Listen to me. You are either going to only have a ministry to the church or you're going to have a ministry to the masses. When you're anointed for the masses, you have to walk in manifest mercy. And manifest mercy is not just you're forgiven. Manifest mercy shows up in the form of medicine, missions, material resource. Those are mercy ministries. When you create community centers, counseling centers, when you buy rows of homes, one of my dreams is to recreate ghettos. I cannot stand most cities' version of ghettos. I think there's a way to have affordable housing in class. You're not going to convince me that it's that difficult to do. Right now, there is so much crisis in America that the opportunities to a real innovator is glaring. If your city is in a problematic state, every day you should be speaking with tongues to ask God to download to you something fresh to do. It needs to be like Solomon when he created and built when nobody's looking and then the queen of Sheba heard of the level of excellence and came to fund what he already built. And listen if you get delivered from a spirit of a Pharisee, God will send your benefactors, he will send your funders. These donations ain't coming from the church fam. They still you're washing cars. You're going to get people who hate God, but money ain't got no soul. I wish I would have. And I know you scared of money, but this black man read the Bible when it say, and it answers all. I got a few questions that I need money to answer. I want you to understand me. God is sending money to you. Oh, I feel this. I don't know why I'm hitting here. There is a money shift. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I prophesy to you. Everybody get up real quick. I got to preach. Get up, get up, get up. And take one big step to the left. Go ahead. Your money is getting ready to shift. I prophesy a sudden, unusual, bizarre change in your tax bracket. And you are about to have more resources than you know what to do with. More buildings than you can use. More grants than you can use. Higher in power. Lift your hands. The lending anointing is coming upon all nations. You are the lender. You are the lender. You are the lender. Scream and you will. Have a seat. Let me read this to you. The lending anointing. The lending anointing. The lending anointing. The lending anointing. If you are tired of loan sharks, you better go to the Lion of Judah. I said the lending anointing. God does not want the sharks with all the money. He wants those that are sent out as lamb among wolves. The lending anointing. The lending anointing. No more payday loans. The lending anointing. No more checking the cash. The lending anointing. God is trying to position you to lend and not borrow. Matthew 23. I dare you to ask God right now, make me a bank. Ask him, make me a bank. 
Now that may never mean that you got $20 million in your possession, but you better believe it'll flow through your hands. What would you do if God anointed you to sponsor? What would you do if God anointed you to fund? Have you ever told God, if you give me the money, I'll glorify you with it. I'm not just trying to give you a hallelujah. I'm trying to adopt schools. I'm trying to run for office. I'm trying to be counsel. I want to be Daniel. I want to be Nathan. I want to be Elijah. I'm not just trying to get stuck behind the pulpits of America. I'm trying to train problems in the world. Say yes. Hey, hey, hey. Say yes. Matthew 23, I've got to read this. I feel a breakthrough. I feel a breakthrough. I said I feel a breakthrough. I feel a breakthrough. There is a genius coming upon you. You are more than an apostle. You are more than a prophet. You are more than an evangelist. You are more than a pastor. You are more than a teacher. You are more than an intercessor. You are an innovator. You are an innovator. You are a creator. You are an idealist. You are a realist. You are a counselor. You are a combiner. You will serve as a consolidation. You will walk with the wicked in the earth and you will never have a dream not sponsored and never have a business not funded if you want to do ministry for real God's going to give you everything you say yes Jesus said to the crowds Feel a box breaking. You don't have to be what they expect. You don't have to do ministry the way they think. Come out that box. I see movies in the spirit. Glory to the Son of God. I said, I see movies in the spirit. Yes, they're going to talk about you. Yes, they're going to say you compromising. Yes, they're going to call you carnal. But they're going to die broke. They're not going to pay off anything. God is not afraid. The Bible said, and no good thing. Why won't you help me? No good thing will he win. Ah! Come those that walk up right. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. I feel the glory. I feel the glory. Feel the glory. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law obey, obey what they tell you. What they're preaching from the Bible is true, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. Verse 4 says they crush people. You will know a Pharisee spirit when they're happy about hurting people. Religion hurts people, crushes them. Not just church people, but any people. You are not filled with the spirit of God to give you an advantage to hurt people. You cannot be anointed of God and be okay when you've hurt somebody. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and they never lift their finger to ease the burden. Verse 5 says, everything they do is for show. They dance for show, sing for show, preach for show, write for show. It's all for bragging rights. Now this is where it's going to get messed up, Elder Terrell. And on their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scriptures inside. And they wear robes. This is not the Stevenson translation. This is, the, this is Jesus talking. They wear robes with extra long tassels and they love to sit at the head table. They love to be at banquets and in seats of honor in the synagogue. They love to receive respectful greetings. They're, they're stuck in their title. They're, they're stuck in their designation because it's only effective in the church. Verse 11 says, the greatest among you is a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humble. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
Verse 13, what sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's face. You won't go in yourselves, and you won't even let nobody else come in. Jesus said, if I cast out devils, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And if you go somewhere to learn how to cast out devils, they call you a fanatic. They say you are emotional, that it's not necessary. They won't go in and they don't want you to do it either. 15, what sorrow awaits you? Teachers of the law and religious Pharisees, you cross the land to make one convert. You get mad because one person leaves your faith. Your whole enterprise is shaken up because one person moves on. You go the distance to make one convert and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell as you are. This is all Jesus. 16, you blind guides. What sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that is the binding to swear by gold in the temple. You blind fool. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? 18, and you say that to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is bounding. How blind are you? A consistent complaint of Jesus is that they are blind. Verse 21, no, verse 22, and when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and God who sits on the throne. Look at verse 23. This is Jesus talking to them. He loved and was seen by them and rebuked them. What sorrow awaits you, you re teachers of religious law and Pharisees. You are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the weightier matters of the law. You stuck on jeans and, and earrings and hair colors and lights and stages you are trapped in things that are preferential but you have no revelation of justice you have no revelation of mercy and you have no revelation of faith now you should tithe but do not neglect the more important things how many churches that you know put more emphasis on tithing than mercy you curse with a curse if you don't tithe but you kick somebody out because their skirt is too low, then you're fine and justified. Hypocrite! Verse 24 says, you blind guides, you strain water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. That's basically Bible term for you are extremely petty. Your life is infatuated with small things. Compare, compare the size of a gnat to a camel. The fact that we're still divided in the body of Christ about who was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And who was baptized in Jesus' name. The fact that that is still an issue in the climate that we are in shows the gnat-camel comparison. Look at 25. What sorrow awaits you? Jesus is telling them, I'm going to judge you. He stands up for a woman called an adultery and tells Pharisees, I'm going to judge you. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? You are so careful to clean the outside of the cup. You want people to hide their brokenness because you don't have their healing. So you want them to show up like they're already whole because it makes you feel better about your impotence. You want them to be presentable because you're not powerful. You want them to work on their attire because you have no authority. And you force them to change from the outside in so that you can accept them. And then they corrode because their insides have not been discipled. You're careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy. You're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First, wash the inside of the cup. You, you, you don't rebuke somebody you don't know. You, you don't chastise somebody you won't hug. You don't deserve the right to cast the devil out of somebody you've not embraced. How you gonna lead a people you too punk to touch? 
You are so insecure in your own masculinity and in your own femininity that you don't want to lay down your reputation to be seen around the broken. But let me tell you what I learned about the broken. They won't always be that way. When broken people are loved well, them same broken people are going to remember you. I have had people come to me in nothing and end up getting recruited to the NFL that give me money every month because they're like, you remembered me when I was nothing. You touched me when they kicked me out you bore the persecution of saying I did not belong and the Bible say he sets the lonely in families I was outcast and you gave me a context now I'm about to fund anything you want to do you choose you want to be praised by the church or received by the world you want to talk about who's had plastic surgery and what secular artist folks is singing with? You idiot. You really think God is more pleased with your gatherings, your conferences, your classes on what color shirts to wear, than he is somebody who is a physician of the soul, who found the appropriate audience for their anointing? We are so far off of the paradigm of Jesus Christ and because of it subsequently we are bankrupt God puts treasure in trashy places so if everything around you is clean then you're missing a realm of currency now your motive should not be to get money out of people it should be to love people black people white people straight people gay people addicted people crazy people if you learn to love people, you have the backing of God for everything you ever want to do. I'm trying to teach you like a father how to get your dream sponsored. Go back to the drawing board and build relational skills. This is more than just marketing and investments. You've got to learn for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God, Jesus died for them even though they reject him. If you were smart, you would come off the performing role for church people and let what's in you come out for the world. You know what the Lord has done for me? He delivered me from the wrong market. <laughs> See, it's not that you're not anointed. You're putting your effort to the wrong audience. Good God today. Look at verse 29 and I'm done. What sorrow awaits you, you teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead men's bones. Outwardly, you look like the righteous people, but your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you? You build tombs for the prophets that you killed. Verse 30 says, then you say, if we would have lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have killed the prophets. One of the things you'll notice, wherever the spirit of the Pharisee is, you will not see a real prophet. Ever. 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 One of the things that blessed me, or that blesses me, is to see prophetic voices that understand the mercy of God. Prophets, judgment is a part of their ministry. So it's easy for them to become judgmental. So what happens is God has to allow hardship to reveal mercy. You will always be doing the dance of judgment and mercy. When a prophetic word comes to a person that anticipates judgment, they have expectation of judgment. And what they see is the mercy of God. They have the attention of heaven. You have to be careful. Hebrews warned us. Be very careful about your hospitality. Be very careful about who you deem whatever. 
Because God tests us, baby. We entertain angels unaware. And nowhere in the Bible will you find that all angels had wings. <laughs> Some of them do. But as surely as Jesus is Lord, some of them probably are laying on streets masquerading as homeless people. They don't want to hear this. Some of them have on fishnet stockings and skeezer skirts. And because you think they want your ugly husband, you walk past them as a woman of God, forgetting that you are the only one that wants that joker. Just because they're a stripper don't mean they ain't got no taste. This is controversial because when you move in ministry like this, you get crucified. Ask Jesus. Your reputation gets under attack. People look at you and like, if you sanctify, why are you around them? Let me tell you now. If it offends you when preachers develop relationships or when churches develop ministries for people that are not in the church context, leave me right now. Did Lil Wayne call me? Did Queen B call me? I'm not going to hide it from y'all. I'm going to selfie. I'm going to be a part of everything because my inheritance is the earth. The church is not my inheritance. That's Jesus' inheritance. I love her. I'm going to give my life to her. Unfortunately, I've been called to change her. I would rather it be something else. But my assignment exceeds Sunday morning. I'm actually more anointed on Monday. Y'all know? <laughs> Slap somebody, say, there is a mantle coming on you for Monday. Well, I feel God on that. We've already perfected Sunday. You need something more for Monday. You need an anointing, a fire for Friday, a terror for Tuesday, a wonder for Wednesday, strength for Thursday. There is a sevenfold anointing coming upon everything you do. No longer will you create solutions for the sanctified. What's coming out of you is going to come for anybody struggling. If you believe it, give the Lord the glory. Vaughn, as long as you write whatever love music you want to, I'm going to back you. I don't care who you're writing for. If it sounds like Michael Jackson, Prince, Earth, Wind, and Fire, I'm flying to L.A. with you. You go to the studio, and I'm going to stand praying tongues and come out, put on a leopard shirt. And I'm going to be in the meetings right with you, fam. I'm going with you. I got your back. Hathaway, if you want to be the mayor of Richmond, I'm going to the inauguration. I'm going to get a tuxedo, and I'm going to be right there with you. You ain't saying nothing in here. Vaughn, however many blocks you want to buy, save my seat at the ribbon cutting. Y'all have got to start stretching what you see. I preach on Sunday, but I'm a boss on Monday. I have employees. I have staffs. I make events. I plan things. I host dignitaries. I do this and that. You're about to receive victory in your versatility. Oh, you better shout. I said, you're about to become more fluid. Stop letting people put periods where God has put a comma in your life. There is a brand new comma coming upon you. You are not only an apostle, you are also a fisherman, and you are also a tent maker, and you are also with this. Come on, the commas are coming. The commas are coming. The com I hear you, AD. The commas are coming. The commas are coming. Get ready. You're not just preaching at convocation. You're preaching at the playoffs. Get ready. The WNBA is going to call you, baby. God is about to send basketball players. The NFL is coming to all nations. The NBA is coming to all nations. There is a disruption coming in Hollywood. Revival is coming to Atlanta. God is about to do something in Boys Town. And the wealth of the wicked. And the wealth of the wicked. And the wealth of the 
the wicked uh, the north is giving her fruit uh, the east is giving their fruit uh, the south is yielding her fruit uh, the earth is yielding her fruit uh, the cave is yielding her fruit under the earth y'all want to shout under the earth uh, get ready uh, for fine jewels uh, get ready uh, for precious stones uh, ambers and gold uh, get ready uh, Oh, praise him if you believe it. Praise him if you believe it. You're not just looking at an apostle and a prophet. You're looking at a filmmaker, a debater, a scholar, a philosopher, a consultant, a CNN advisor. Oh, God's got some stuff coming out. Come on, tell somebody, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. If you get brave, <laughs> you'll be a comma. Pharisees want you to stay right here. But there is a divine diversity coming to your life. Let them say what they're going to say. Your family, listen, listen. When you start to explore all that's in you, the first level of persecution is going to be familial. If they sense, you know how we are, that you make more money than you used to, that you're in a different position, you're going to have folk calling you from elementary school, high school, half cousins, whatever that is. Oh, I'm so proud of you. I always knew you. I've been watching. That's so odd. Because when I didn't know this was in me, I actually needed somebody who would tell me this was in me. Now that I'm it, you trying to confirm something that I'm already walking in? I don't need confirmation for what's manifest. I need confirmation for what's invisible. You can keep your compliment for what I'm already walking in. If you're nervous about your daddy being mad, because you won't pay off his mortgage or your mama being mad because you won't pay off her car or your sister being mad because you ain't invited her to your gala, you're going to miss your impact. It's a real price. If your target is church fame, then I pray you get rich with Monopoly money. To be famous in church is like to be famous in Monopoly, to be rich with Monopoly money. It's the same thing. What you gonna do with church fame? The most you're gonna do with church fame is find yourself on a flyer. And if that's what you got saved for, God bless you. And I see in the spirit of vision, many of you are being shot in the next 10 years to Capitol Hill. I'm telling you, you, you're going to look and find yourself in positions like, how did I end up? Oh, you don't believe that. It's coming as surely as Jesus is Lord. I know you don't see it now, but that's the point of this conference. You're going to look up and you're going to think everybody in the room deserves to be there but you. You're going to find yourself being called by people who have more than you. You don't allow God to baptize your definitions. You're going to live and die in a pew. And your legacy will be that you are a preaching man, a praying grandmother. But why don't you work to build something else? God is with you. You're not the only one going beyond. He's going to you. Moses said, I will go if you go. God told Moses, I will cause my goodness to pass over you. There are options coming to you, journeys and paths. You got, after this conference, you will have conversations with people that church people don't want you to have conversations with. You will have environments, opportunities to do coffee and tea and to dream possibilities. You will be invited to discussions with people and none, you will be the only Jesus in the room. 
Now, if it makes you feel better to pray in tongues under your breath, do it. I do it all the time. But you better speak fluent English when you're answering me. You better punctuate yourself well. Get you a stylist if you don't know how to dress. You can be a Jew in Babylon. When in Rome, you got to do as the Romans do. And it don't make you a Roman. It means you use their culture to advance the kingdom. We're going to do it for the culture. Do it for the culture. Do it for the culture. MTV, BET, CNN, Fox News. I release you into it now. If you, if you refuse to be converted by darkness, God will always send you to rule in the midst of it. And he will give you a scepter to say rule in the midst of your enemies. Pagans will prosper you. God told Cyrus in Isaiah 45, to Cyrus my anointed. I will open up the gates and the bars of iron. And I know we quote that. We've learned it this week. But what you didn't know about Cyrus was that he was a pagan. It's sad that authority is on people who don't believe in God, who can do more with a phone call than you can with a fast. What does it say about your Holy Ghost? That a hellion can send a text and it can change stuff in perpetuity. And you spend an hour in tongues and nobody's hearing you. Choose what you want. Would you rather be applauded by, sing girl, preach man. You working doc. You want to parade among the Pentecostals? Or would you rather have nations celebrate your arrival because of the hospitals you build? Because of the wells you dig. I'm not talking about Jacob's well. I'm talking about clean water and deserts in Ethiopia. Do you think that your only prosperity is domestic? If you want to prosper, why don't you have a passport? You need a passport more than for vacation. It's a part of our warfare to retrieve the wealth of nations. You want a multi-unit building on your block? But what would you do if the Lord gave you hundreds of acres in Haiti? Can you only think in America? See, what I'm trying to show you is that this is so much bigger than what you think. It's bigger than who you can impress. It's about what you can influence. Now, your benefit is you understand warfare. So when you're talking to something and you identify something, and because of your teaching, you know when something's demonic. You don't run from it in prayer. A devil manifests in prayer, you're like, shut up, I'm gonna say what's up. A devil manifests in a business deal, and you don't know what to do. All of it is warfare. <laughs> and you can learn diplomacy when you're doing business with a crook. You need the gifts of the Spirit to do this. You need the word of knowledge. Let me tell you about how the gift of the word of wisdom has impacted my business life. If you can see the future, then it impacts what you have courage for today. When we tell you to be a part of a prophetic house, it's not because we just want you prophesying all day. And nobody likes to prophesy more than me. But it's because these supernatural powers are relative even in secular society. I have been walking in malls and discerned artists. The same way Samuel discerned David, I have discerned who would be famous. I've discerned it and willing to quononia with them. Touch them. Talk to them to stabilize them for their success. So you choose. You want to just sit on the front row, preach every day? Or would you rather be remembered? See, I envision my funeral 
being filled with people who have the Holy Ghost and people who don't. I envision 30,000 folk watching live all around the world and people are like, oh my God, he was a preacher. It's almost like you have to remind yourself that Dr. King was a preacher. Like when we talk about Dr. King, we're like, oh crap, he was a minister because he did so much more. It helped that he was a preacher, but he understood the power of engagement. He was not just wasting his words on people who loved hymns and didn't want to heal the world. You choose. If you make your choice, God will anoint you. Lift your hands. I'm going to pray for some of you. Because I feel like God wants to put a love in you for them and a commitment for you to not be like them. Pharisees are dangerous, they're murderous, they're vile, they'll kill you, blacklist you, blackmail you. <laughs> they'll do all kinds of things to try to stop you. But when you commit to loving people, period, God will always open your creativity. Right now in the spirit, there are some things coming to you that's going to be trademarked, that's going to be copywritten, I see that some of you that have the gift of healing will be opening restaurants. See, you only see the gifts of the Spirit in this context. Not only do people who lay hands on people in church have a healing anointing, but the gift of healing also manifests in hospitality. You can heal people in a restaurant. I dare you to go get a franchise. I dare you go get a burger restaurant. I dare you to open up. Come on, you better hear what the Spirit of God is saying unto you. That is just as much healing as everything else. Oh yeah, I feel you now. Come on, lift your hands. The anointing is coming in this room to give you the bravery and the thick skin for what else is in you. Oh yes, the anointing to be a landlord is in this room that you're going to own things and for some people, you'll give it to the homeless uh, I see an anointing for orphanages. I see an anointing for adoption. Come on, open your eyes now. This is more than just preaching and teaching. You're going to start to preach with your ideas. You're going to be so bad, you don't just preach with your mouth. Uh, your money is about to preach. Your ideas are about to preach. Uh, I see brand new coffee shops being born that's going to shake Starbucks. You don't believe this. I see brand new environments of healings I see massage and, and, and I see cosmetology schools, I see barber colleges, that's going to be the masquerade for discipleship I see unique things being born in the earth one of you in here is about to have a brand new airline yeah, God's going to give you the grace to do unusual things, those of you that are apostolic get ready for construction companies as Jesus was a carpenter and he was our great apostle you're about to hire laborers and you're gonna regentrify prisoners get ready man of God God's gonna anoint your city and anoint your church there are preachers in this room where the law entities in your city are going to sentence prisoners to you you are about to be more than a multi-site movement your church is going to be a juvenile detention center the local school center is going to say we've given up on Antoine we've given up on Renee if you can regentrify them if you can change them if your preaching can heal them we'll get behind your school we'll get behind your idea get ready to be a chaplain God is about to send miracle workers into Catholic hospitals and you will do signs and you will do wonders open your eyes Abraham it's bigger than what you first saw it will be as the sand God is sending you not just into the 1040 window you're going into the 4070 window you're about to sit with the Queen of England there are nations that are going to 
to name you as a dignitary because the bishop didn't ordain you and the apostle didn't platform you. There are kings and queens, princes in foreign provinces that's going to call you an ambassador. You were upset because you didn't preach at the conference, but you're going to preach at the UN. How would you act if God opened your mouth and put his word in you for the kings of nations? Get ready, get ready to sit around tables with Steven Spielberg. Get ready for Spike Lee. Get ready. There is an uprising. There is an uprising. There is an uprising. Come on, you are the remnant of Israel. You are the remnant of the house of Jacob. You are the daughters of Judah. And you are burning out you are breaking open get ready for you to become the local homeless shelter your company your idea is gonna replace public aid I'm gonna make you like Joseph people will come to you for housing assistance people will come to you something is in you that's gonna deal with the student loan crisis you're getting ready to send 100 black men to college I want you to receive it. You're getting ready uh, to have scholarships uh, in the name of your mother, uh, in the name of your father. Uh, you're getting ready uh, to have foundations. Uh, you're getting ready uh, to be a philanthropist, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, a visioneer, uh, a pioneer. Something is moving. Uh, something is changing. Uh, feel his glory. It's going to be like the sand. Uh, you're getting ready uh, to go to Hollywood. Uh, there are brand new plays. Brand new movies, brand new films, brand new ideas. I hear the Lord saying, I'm blowing on the artists in this room. Those of you that draw, those of you that paint, your eyes are being opened like the servant prayed for the prophets of Elijah. That your eyes will be open. You photographers are getting ready to capture images of the seven wonders of God. Mountains are bound. Rivers are opening, streams are flowing. You're getting ready to reveal the manifold wonder of God, the manifold bliss of God. And the heathen will bow, and the pagan will bow, and the wicked will bow, and great will be the glory, and great will be the reward. Great will be the righteous. Your life is like a seed laid down. Your life is like a drink offering. Why don't you live? Pour it out. And don't just pour on the church. Pour on the world. Be like Mary. Break open your alabaster box and pour out. It's expensive. It's going to cost you everything. But you got nothing else to lose. Who knows if you came into the kingdom for such a time as this you've been through hell been through betrayal been through backstabbing been through divorce been through disease who knows if this was not the reason that you were born be like Esther if I perish I perish but somebody's got to do it why not here why not now look at me funny but I'm going in there is a nation dying in anguish there is a generation dying in anguish I'm gonna stir up the gift of God I'm gonna stir up my intelligence I'm waxing stronger I'm waxing bolder I'm waxing clearer come on God is putting a brand new decree in your mouth for the nations if you want to be sent out scream in this room Ho! Ho! Scream! 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 We are world changers. The house of the hungry, the home of the broken, the place where world changers gather. We are not church changers. We are world changers. This is who we are. This is what we do. And we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to the wise. It is. And God is using the foolishness, the foolishness, the foolishness of the world to confound, to amaze to wonder 
These are your greatest hours. Go ahead and praise Him. Oh, I don't hear you. As you praise Him, your dreams are coming back alive. You hid your dreams because you thought they weren't holy enough. But your dreams are about to be resurrected. Scream yes. Come alive. Come alive. In your spirit. In your GPA. In your boldness. Come alive. We ain't scared of no Pharisee. Come alive. Don't fight it, yield to it, yield to it. Don't fight it, yield to it. Atmospheres like this is what changes you for your assignment. Yield to it. Come on, yield to it. Don't fight this. Drink Drink this air. Your city, 
your people or the world. It's a real conflict. Many of you women of God have grown up against models of women in ministry where you didn't know if it was holy enough for you to do what you wanted to do. And then many of you felt judged because you didn't want the women's ministry. You wanted to do something else. You wanted to be a principal or you wanted to do this and you felt judged by a Pharisee mentality. And what it did was it put you in a prison. Pastors do this. First ladies do this. But today you are about to be delivered from definitions that suppress your potential. From definitions that make you fight your business operation, your aspirations, your performing arts aspirations, your academic aspirations, even your political aspirations. You're coming out of that guilt of not being what they expect. You've been having dreams about it all your life, visions about it all your life, and church people arrested you. God's setting you free. He's setting you free. He's setting you free. I want you to lift your hands. I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to allow God to show you what he wants next out of you. Come on, between you and the Lord. I, I want you to see and imagine who you are and what you will be doing. Listen. If you're going to retire and only rest, then there's no point in your retirement. You're supposed to retire for more effectiveness. You're not supposed to retire frustrated. You're supposed to retire focused for the next phase of life. God wants many of you to retire when you want to, not when you have to. I want you to lift your hands and let the Lord begin to show you some stuff. Let the minstrels play a while, but begin to show you what he wants out of you. What are you going to be doing? You a councilwoman? You a councilman? Are you an investor? An overseer, maybe? What are you doing? Are you debating? Are you negotiating? Are you a franchise owner? What does God want you to do? Is it hospitals? Is it schools? What is it? Don't be afraid to see it. Don't be afraid to see it. It's not fantasy. <laughs> Don't be afraid to see it. Whoa, I see so many clinics being born. Literal, specialized health clinics. Why can't you live in more than one city? Who told you you couldn't? What's the law that says you only have to have one residence? Why can't you have a house here and there? Sir David, find your way to me. I'm asking that an anointing to liberate these pastors. And I'm asking that a spirit, a mantle of bravery. They got to risk their reputations, their colleagues, their targets, even their positions. Let something fresh come upon these. Let 2019, I hear this fresh in the spirit. Let 2019 be the year of audacity. Oh, you didn't hear what I, let it be the year of audacity. That there is an anointed audaciousness coming to you. Where you're not going to be working for acceptance. You're going to be working for effectiveness. The realm of impact that's been born in your life is going to exceed your wildest dreams. Oh, yes. Give him a microphone. Dr. Ross, there's some of those prophets and frontliners that come up here with me to help me. Come on, do it quickly. Frontliners of some of the prophets come up here.
is a strong anointing. Now the Lord has shown me that very many of you are professors. Very many of you are professors. You just don't realize it yet. Something's going to change in America where as Christianity comes under more scrutiny, Ivy League universities are going to reach professors to teach and show them how to keep the future of Christianity. If I be God's prophet, that's going to be. That's going to be. One of the things that you don't realize is that for years, D.C. has had money to contract wizards and warlocks to solve crimes. For years, it's a known historic fact. From the days of JFK on back, they've had soothsayers and sorcerers, psychics that advise in D.C. There is a Daniel among you. God is going to change this thing. I've been prophesying for years that in our lifetime, we're going to see a boldly Holy Ghost filled president. I'll be a man of God. It's not going to be this. We're going to see one. You watch and see what I say. And there's going to be some equality in a better way, in a broader way, where things are going to change. I'm telling you, God's going to do something even in the realm of chaplaincy. It's not just going to be where preachers and pastors go to teams to be friends. It's going to be where there's literal deliverance for influencers because they trust your intent. I also see that there's an anointing for invention. That is a realm of creativity that we've not tapped into. One of the things David always did was create instruments. Their, their products, ooh, uh, uh, hair, uh, makeup, uh, 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 solutions coming out of you, literal recipes of healing that's going to flow out of you. Some of you that are writers, your textbooks are going to be found in the classrooms of America. Oh, some of you in here are going to write children books that's going to combat the Antichrist agenda in children's literature that's trying to put the seed of perversion in people before they're 12. It is so. Father, I'm asking for a very profound anointing for impartation. I'm asking that you would do something that would break the yoke, make these pastors feel more free than they ever have in their lives. Lord, those that are bleeding out from ministry and bleeding out from the betrayal of those that they led and those that they helped. I'm asking that you would bring immediate healing to them and I'm asking that as we minister to them that scales would fall off their eyes. Let it be like what happened when Ananias went to Saul that after being blind for a season that they developed brand new audacity to see like they never seen Come on, lift your hands. We're going to minister to you. Come on, begin to go. Come on, lift your hands up. God's coming to you. Thank you. 
feel courage arising? If you feel bravery arising? If you sense some audacity coming upon you? I want you to lift up the loudest shouts you can for a new season. Come on, give God the shout of praise. Come on. Come on, it's going to be different. Come on, praise Him. Come on, you are more than what you know. Come on, shout. It will be as the sand. Shout hallelujah. We're going to break, but if you're still getting ministry, you can stay at the altar.